Hi, this is Geometry Lesson 1-6, Deductive Reasoning. In this lesson, we'll be able to use deductive reasoning to draw conclusions. Some important topic vocabularies are deductive reasoning, law of detachment, and law of syllogism. Let's look at critique and explain. A deck of 60 game cards are numbered from 1 to 15 on one of the four different shapes, triangle, circle, square, and pentagon. A teacher selects five cards and displays four of the cards. Now we can see that there are two, three, five, and seven cards with all triangles shaped. She tells her class that all of the cards she selected have the same shape and asks them to draw a conclusion with a fifth card. So Chen says the fifth card is 11. And Carolina says the fifth card has a circle. And so Chen is talking about the number. Carolina is talking about the shape. Let's look at part A. Describe how each student might have reached his or her conclusion. Is each student's conclusion valid? Explain. How do you think Chen was thinking? What are her reasoning, uh, reasonings behind her prediction about the fifth card? She can look at the pattern. She probably looked at the pattern of the numbers. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. And 5 plus 2 is 7. So looking at that, she may, she may conclude that maybe the next one is going to be added uh, 4. And I like what I don't know what her reasoning is, but she may have looked at the pattern and try to figure it out. What could be the pattern? Maybe um, maybe she looked at the number here. What is what is what are what is uh, one common thing that all these numbers have? They're all prime numbers, so they're consecutive prime numbers. So she's thinking maybe the next number is eleven, the next prime number after seven. Um, and look at Carolina. The fifth card has a circle. Where is her reasoning coming from? She didn't draw a conclusion about the number of the fifth card. Um, she may have concluded that fifth card will be a circle because the back of the card has circles. Maybe. So they have their own reasoning, right? So, uh, But we're trying to figure out what could be their reasoning behind their prediction for part A. So let's record that. So we can say that Chen noticed this number is a prime number and assumed the fifth card must be the next prime number, 11. Carolina did not draw a conclusion about the number of the fifth, on the fifth card. She may have concluded that the fifth card will be a circle because the back of the card has circles. So whose uh, who's, um, conclusion is valid? In other words, reasonable or must be true. Um, Chen's, Chen's conclusion is more valid than Carolina because she is uh, looking at the pattern and drawing inferences about it and predicting the next uh, number based on the, uh, the data. Carolina is coming from it's more like a guessing you see that so Chen's conclusion we could say is valid let's look at part B what are other possibilities of the fifth card what are other possibilities and conclusion that you can make using other reasonings what could the teacher say to narrow the possibilities? Could, teacher, could the teacher give them more hints? 
So another possibility that you can have uh, about it could be a shape, right? It could be another triangle because so far we only had triangles, right? Um, that's, that's not 2, 3, 5, or 7 because it, we know that we have a deck of 60 game cards numbered from 1 to 15 on one of four different shapes. So for, for a triangle to come out, we already have the cards that are numbered 2, 3, 5, and 7. So we know the next card is going to be a, a triangle. If it's a triangle, it's not going to be 2, 3, 5, or 7. Okay? That could be another valid conclusion. What could be some hints that the teacher could give? Uh, if the teacher said it's an odd number, then we can narrow down the possibilities even more, right? Or an even number, or even a type of a number, right? If it's going to be a prime number or, or a composite number, that could narrow our possibilities down. Let's write that down. There we go. It could be any triangle shaped number other than 2, 3, 5, or 7. As the teacher said, it is an odd number that would narrow down the possibilities even more. So throughout the lesson, think about this essential question. How is deductive reasoning different from inductive reasoning? Right? We're going to look at deductive reasoning. And we talked about inductive reasoning last class. And so we're going to compare how it's different. Let's start with example one. Determine whether a statement is true. Given that a conditional and its conclusion are true, can you use deductive reasoning to determine whether the hypothesis is true? Um, here's the definition of deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is a process of reasoning using given and previously known facts to reach a logical conclusion. Previously known facts. Do you remember the definition for inductive reasoning? What is an inductive reasoning and how is it different? If you look back at lesson four, inductive reasoning, uh, inductive reasoning is a type of reasoning that reaches conclusion based on a pattern of specific examples or past events. So how is it different with deductive reasoning? While inductive reasoning is based on patterns and past events, deductive reasoning um, needs previously known facts. It has to be facts to reach a logical conclusion. So it is, it is hard to prove or the, uh, prove that inductive, the, the conclusion from inductive reasoning is true all the time because then you'd have to test all the cases which may have infinite numbers of, uh, of cases, right? But deductive reasoning has known facts for reasoning and um, using those facts, you reach a conclusion that is logical. It's based on, um, it's based on facts rather than figuring out a pattern and say, Oh, by this pattern, I think uh, the prediction might be this, right? So it's, it's, a, it's more of a prediction for inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is, um, is more of a, of a hypothesis. It's, so in other words, deductive reasoning is stronger, stronger than inductive reasoning. Let's look at example one. Given that a conditional and its conclusion are true, can you use deductive reasoning to determine whether the hypothesis is true? We have a truth table here. We're given facts that if P, then Q is true. So the, uh, the hypothesis, if hypothesis, then the conclusion, this conditional statement is true. And Q, the conclusion is true. We're going to make a truth table for the conditional if P, then Q. Okay, so if these two are true, then your hypothesis must be true, right? Um, or it could be false. 
So we have these two cases, TTT -T -T and then FTT. Um, if your hypothesis is true and your conclusion is false, it makes your conditional statement false. We learned this from last lesson, right? Uh, and then if they're both false, then your conditional is true. You cannot determine whether the hypothesis is true, right? Because there are two cases where you have uh, the hypothesis being true or false, but your conclusion being true and your conditional statement being true. So if you look at the truth table and compare uh, the cases, we have two cases. So it doesn't always have to be true. Let's look at try number one. Given that a conditional and its hypothesis are true, can you determine whether the conclusion is true? So look at the truth table again. Given that your conditional, so your, your last column, and your hypothesis, your P, is they're true. So look at the cases where they're both true. The first one, and then, nope, nope, nope. Only the first one, right? So if your hypothesis is true and your conditional is true, can you determine whether the conclusion is true? Yeah, there's only one case where, where it fits the criteria, right? So it must, it must be that your conclusion is true in this case. So the answer is yes, you can conclude that the con conclusion is true. Okay. So in this case, you do have to use a truth table. You can't figure it out by yourself. So use a truth table as much as possible. That's, it's not cheating. It's data. It's given facts. So let's look at this concept on the next page, law of detachment. The law of detachment is a law of logic that states if a conditional statement and its hypothesis are true, then its conclusion is also true. So from our try number one, we know that if your conditional and your hypothesis are true, there's only one case uh, in the truth table that matches this condition, and that's when your conclusion has to be true. So we know as a fact that if the hypothesis and the conditional are true, your conclusion must also be true, and that becomes the law of detachment. Now, you can apply the law of detachment and use it to draw real-world and mathematical conclusion. Let's look at example two. Assume that each set of given information is true, and uh, let's draw conclusions. Part A, if Alicia scores 85 or greater on her test, she'll earn an A as her final grade. Alicia scores 89 on her, on her test. Well, can you logically conclude? We know that this is true, the first statement. Um, so to apply the law of detachment, you'll determine the truth value, the conditional statement, if P then Q, and the hypothesis P. If P then Q, if Alicia scores 85 or greater on her test, that's a hypothesis. Then she will earn an A as a final grade. Great. That's the condition. That's the conclusion, Q. And this given conditional is true. And your hypothesis, Alicia scores 85 or greater on her test, must be true. The hypothesis is true because her condition, 89, is greater than 85, so the hypothesis is true in her case. And the conditional and its hypothesis are true right now, which means we can use the law of detachment to conclude that the conclusion must be true. You can conclude that Alicia will earn an A as her final grade. And this is a type of deductive reasoning. You're using the law and proven facts to determine the conclusion, okay? Part B, if point D is in the interior of angle ABC, then, then measure of angle ABC is equal to measure of angle ABD plus measure of angle DBD, DBC. 
What can you logically conclude about measure angle ABC? Okay. Uh, D is in the interior. We already know that um, uh, by angle addition postulate, if D is in the interior side and if it divides the angle, then the two sections of the divided angle uh, must be adding up to the, the bigger angle that is being divided. So ABD here, 34, plus DBC here, 48, must be the angle of ABC, okay? So using the truth value, if P then Q, if point D is in the interior of angle AB, ABC, then uh, these two angles add up to ABC, right? And using, uh, using the angle addition postulate, this condition is true. It's not like it doesn't make sense, right? It does make sense. So looking at your hypothesis, point D, is point D is in, in the interior of angle ABC? Yeah, in this case, it is. It's not like outside, right? So that is also true. So we can conclude that the conclusion is true. What is the conclusion? You can conclude that measure of angle ABC is equal to the addition of these. Or you can say it's going to be 82 degrees if you add them. Okay, so in this case, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these statements, um, a lot of these conclusions made by deductive reasoning may seem obvious because you use it all the time in real life. But this is the process of why it is obvious and it, is, it may sound like a common sense to you because we're using deductive reasoning, using facts to determine the conclusion that is that that also must be true. There is not a possibility, really, uh, that it, it shouldn't be true if they're both if your given conditions are true. Let's look at try number two. Assume that each set of given information is true, and determine um, the conclusion that you can make logically. So if you can figure this out by yourself, come back when you're ready for answers. Okay, are we ready? Part 2a. If two angles are congruent, then the measures of the two angles are equal to each other. Um, angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. What can you logically conclude about the measures of angle 1 and 2? Okay, so what is your conditional? What is your hypothesis and what is your conclusion? This is your, conclu this is your conditional statement. If two angles are congruent, that is your P, then the measures of the two angles are equal to each other, that is your Q. You need to meet the hypothesis uh, P true. So if two angles are congruent, then your hypothesis is true. Uh, we, have a, we have a data here. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. So your hypothesis is true. If P then Q is true, and your hypothesis is true, then your conclusion must be true. So conclude that the measures of the two angles are equal to each other. So we can say M angle 1, which represents measure of angle 1, is equal to measure of angle 2. That is your conclusion. Yeah, I hear some does, but yes. Uh, breaking them down into the conditional statement and the hypothesis, we're missing a conclusion uh, that is slightly in different words. Okay, so reach a conclusion using the hypothesis you have. Part B, if you finish the race in under 30 minutes, then you win a prize. You finish the race in 26 minutes, what can you logically conclude? So what is our conditional here? If P, you finish the race in under 30 minutes, then you win a prize. Winning a prize is your conclusion. And here's your data. You finish the race in 26 minutes. Does this satisfy your hypothesis? If you finish the race in under 30 minutes, is 26 under 30 minutes? Yeah, 26 is less than 30. So your hypothesis, P, is true. 
And so you can conclude that you win a prize. You can simply say you win a prize. Yeah, it wasn't that hard, right? Deductive reasoning will be a lot, a lot uh, easier for you um, than inductive reasoning. Let's look at the next page. We have another concept. Now we have another law, law of syllogism. The law of syllogism is a law of logic that states that given two true conditionals, we need two conditionals. So if P then Q, we have two of them, right? With the conclusion of the first being the hypothesis of the second. So they're related like that. The conclusion of the first con conditional must be the hypothesis of the second conditional. Then there exists a third true conditional having the hypothesis of the first and the conclusion of the second. So what does that mean? Um, so in summary, if P then Q and if Q then R are true, then we know that P, if P then R must be true, okay? You need to meet this criteria. This conclusion Q on the first conditional statement must be the hypothesis of the second conditional statement. Then we can conclude that the hypothesis of the first conditional statement is true. The conclusion of the second conditional statement must be true. Okay, uh, let's look at example three. Apply the law of syllogism to draw real world and mathematical conclusions. So it's very similar to transitive property uh, of e equality. If, if A um, is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C, okay? But this is talking about the conditionals. Assume that each set of conditionals is true. What can you conclude using the law of syllogism? Okay, part A. If Kenji plays the trumpet, then he plays that brass instrument. This is the first conditional. That's P, that's Q. Now we have the next one. If he plays a brass instrument, so now if Q, he is a member of the marching band. This is another conclusion, and we can mark it as an R. But our... our our Q, our conclusion in the first statement is our hypothesis in the next statement, right? So then what can we conclude using the law of syllogism? We can say if P, then R. So if Kanji plays the trumpet, he is a member of the marching band. Could be uh, the conclusion that we can get combining these two conditional statements using the law of syllogism. All right, part B, uh, another example. If points A, B, and C are collinear, which means they're on the same line, and B is between A and C, then ray B, A, so imagine that they're all on the same line, and B is between A and C, okay? Then the ray B, A and the ray B, C are opposite rays. Is that true? Yeah. If uh, the ray B, A, and B, C are opposite rays, now we have repeated conclusion statement from the previous conditional. And now, automatically, you should think, oh, law of syllogism. Then A, B plus B, C. So we see that the notation doesn't have a bar above the letters. So we're talking about the length. Length of A, B plus the length of B, C is equal to the length of AC. What can you conclude? So now we can say that the first hypothesis in the first conditional statement, if points A, B, and C are collinear and B is between A and C, then skip this whole thing and say, then AB plus BC is equal to AC, okay? The more you get used to it, the, the easier it gets to use the law of syllogism. Uh, let's look at try number three. Assume that each set of conditionals is true. You're going to use the law of syllogism to draw a conclusion. See if you can, see if you can use the law of syllogism to draw a conclusion.
by itself using these two con conditionals. Okay, are you ready to check answer? Look at part A. What is your con conclusion statement using the law syllabus? If an integer is divisible by 6 and div it is divisible by 2 and, there, and, it, and that's repeated, so then it is an even number. Is, is the okay. So if an integer is divisible by 6, then it is an even number. Part B, if it's, a, if it's a holiday, then you do not have to go to school. And if it is a labor day, then it is a holiday. Wait, do we see anything that's repeated? Not really, but you have to be flexible about this. Uh, what is a Labor Day? It's a holiday. So actually, uh, our, uh, our, our second conditional is a little bit uh, flipped. Second and third, uh, first and second conditional. So if you if you put the second conditional statement in front of the first conditional statement here, if it is a Labor Day, then it is a holiday, right? Then that's a conclusion that we have uh, for the next statement, right? That if it's a holiday, then you do not have to go to school. So you you can you can change the order of the sentence and make it uh, usable for the law of syllogism, okay? So then you don't have to start with, if it's a holiday, then it's a, it's a holiday. Like, no, you have to, in order to use the syllogism, you have to match the conclusion of the first statement with the hypothesis of the second statement. So if it, if it doesn't really work that way, you can change the, you can switch the order of the sentences, that's fine, okay? So in this case, you're gonna start with, if it is a Labor Day, then what? Your second sentence is actually this one. Then you, it's a holiday, so if it's a holiday, you don't have to go to school. So if it's a Labor Day, then you do not have to go to school. Okay, that one's a tricky one, but if you got it correct, good job. Well done. Let's look at the next example. Apply the laws of detachment and syllogism to draw conclusions. Now we're going to use both, and you're going to determine what to use. What conclusions can you draw from the following true statements? Okay, these are true statements. If you're climbing a mountain at an altitude of 28,500 feet or higher, then you're on the tallest mountain above sea level on Earth. If you are on the tallest mountain above sea level on Earth, which is repeated, note, note, then you are on Mount Everest. You are climbing a mountain at an altitude of 29,000 feet. Wow. You're going to identify conditional statements and use the laws of logic to draw a conclusion. Okay, we have two conditional statements and then an information. Okay, you're going to use a lot of detachment. So your, your conditional statement, if P then Q, if you're climbing a mountain at an altitude of blah, 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 the first sentence, um, and then your hypothesis, you're climbing a mountain at an altitude of 29,000 feet, and say they're both true, right? Because um, 29,000 feet is higher than 28,500 feet. So it is true for the, for the hypothesis of the conditional statement. So by the law of detachment, the conclusion Q is true. You're on the tallest mountain above sea level on earth. How can we use the law of syllogism here? Using the two conditional statement here, if P then Q and if Q then R, you can say, if you are climbing a mountain at an altitude of 28,500 feet or higher than you are on Mount Everest. And now we have an information that we're climbing 
at a mountain higher than 28,500 because we're at 29,000 feet above the ground. And so we can also conclude that we're on Mount Everest. So by the law of detachment, the conclusion is that we're on a Mount Everest. So there could be two different kind of conclusion using the different laws, right? Uh, but basically, they're actually talking about the same thing. If you're on Mount Everest, Mount Everest is the top, tallest mountain above sea level on Earth, right? Um, they're similar, but technically, you reach slightly different conclusions using uh, law of syllogism or detachment, okay? So you have to be strategic about that. So using both of them, you can, using both of them, you're climbing, uh, the, using both of them, you can say that you're, you're uh, on Mount Everest. So let's look at number four. See if you can do it by yourself. Martin walks his dog before dinner every day. Martin is now eating his dinner using the law of detachment. What conclusions can you draw from these true statements? See if your conclusion is the same as mine. Okay, what is the conclusion you got? Have you broken down the hypothesis and the conditionals and the conclusions? So this is an information, right? There's no if then statement. So that's an that's an information we have. We're gonna make conclusion using this information. Oh wait, this is a pattern. So we can make this as a as a conditional. If it's before dinner, he walks his dog. Or if he walks his dog, he um, it's probably before dinner, right? So if it's, uh, Martin is now eating his dinner, so we can expect something, yeah? What conclusions can you draw? So Martin is now eating his dinner. Um, he eats dinner every day. Uh, that's another information that you know, right? Um, by this information. So dinner every day and walking his dog before dinner every day uh, means if he's eating his dinner right now, is he gonna walk his dog or is he, has he already walked his dog? It says before dinner, he walks his dog before dinner. So when he's eating, it means that he has already walked his dog. So the conclusion is that Martin has already walked his dog. Okay, let's summarize our lesson. So we learned about deductive reasoning and the two laws um, in deductive reasoning. So the first law, law of detachment, says that if a conditional statement and its hypothesis are true, then its conclusion is also true. And law of syllogism needs two conditionals, with conclusion of the first being the hypothesis of the second. And then we can say there's going to be a third true conditional having the hypothesis of the first and the conclusion of the second. So in other words, if P then Q and if Q then R are true, then if P, then R must be true. These are the symbols. If P, then Q, and P are true, then Q must be true. Okay, guys, that was lesson six, deductive reasoning. Well, uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask Ms. King in class. Otherwise, we'll continue with the next lesson, um, lesson seven, which is about writing proofs in the next video. Thanks guys, bye.